computer and then the class all these guys are logging in late they are blocking I'm trying to find the class. I can't find them on the list. Yeah, there you are. Okay. Domain host. Okay. So, can you see my screen? Yes, because it's coming you're not, blank. Yeah, sir. It's coming blank now. Okay, let me just. Now? Yeah, it's coming, yes, sir. sir. Okay, all right. So, because you take over as host and you admit people or let people out, whatever you want to do. Okay. All right. So, let's yes. start this session. Uh, again, uh, got about uh, another hundred odd uh, cases to do. Thoracic people don't get disheartened. There's a lot of thoracic today. There's a lot of statistics as well. So, let's see how you get on with it. Okay. So, here is the x ray of a patient in front of you. I want to know the diagnosis and I want you to tell me one thing, one or two things which are particular to this pathology. There's another pathology with a similar x-ray. So I want you to tell me what is the difference between the two pathology and what is your first line of action in this? Okay. Tell me yes when you're ready. Can you read what is there on the slide? Yes, sir. So there is subcutaneous emphysema, there is pneumomedial sternum, there is also air under the diaphragm, and there is a prominent renal outline due to air. So there is air leaking into the chest and leaking into the abdomen. What is the clinical condition that you think can cause this. Ready? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, this is Borov syndrome, okay? This is Borov syndrome. Now the key thing with Borov syndrome is the pressure rupture of the esophagus and can give rise to the Haman sign. We'll talk about that in a minute. And patient presents with acute chest uh, pain and the treatment is usually surgical if you get to it in time. If you don't get to it in time, then you have to do conservative management uh, because the whole thing gets soiled. And the key thing to this is, this is a this is a full thickness tear. Full thickness tear of the esophagus with spillage into the mediastinum. So there's very quickly soiling. So you have a window of only about six hours. Within six hours, you have to uh, try and uh, repair the esophagus. Otherwise, once the infection sets in, then it's very difficult to put stitches on the esophagus. Uh, Haman sign is listening to using, uh, is an auscultatory sign. You go to the precordial area and you listen with the stethoscope. And when you listen with the stethoscope, you'll get crackling. And when you hear crackling, that is a classical sign of pneumomedias. Okay. So this is how it looks like. So these are the few things. Borov syndrome is usually post MSS, iatrogenic, uh, left posterior lateral, most common. So, more common on the left side. Clinically presents with chest and mid epigastric pain. Uh, can present with pleuritic pain, worse by neck flexion and swallowing. And I told you about the mediastinal crunch, which is the Hammond sign. You must remember that. Uh, and there is rapid development of sepsis. So, within a few hours, very quickly, the whole thing gets uh, infected. Chest X-ray is, is diagnostic, but of course you carry on to do a CT scan and an upper GI endoscopy. Start with antibiotics and uh, very quickly think about surgery. If you are in the very, very early phase of surgery, then it's okay. Uh, if you're in the very early phase of diagnosis, then surgery is okay. Otherwise, the treatment is conservative and you might have to just treat it uh, either with stenting and with the uh, uh, drainage of the chest. Uh, there is something called as a Mackler's triad, which is a combination of lower chest pain, vomiting, subcutaneous emphysema, classically seen in Borov syndrome. So Mackler's triad is a finding of Borov syndrome. Okay, happy? So two marks for this, one mark for knowing the syndrome, and second mark is for telling me that it was a full thickness curve rupture. Okay? All right. 
what is this? Oh God, I already showed you the name is there. I forgot. It's okay. So you know that this is the McConnell sign. What does it represent? Tell me where do you get McConnell sign? One mark for telling me where you get McConnell sign. Okay, it's an acute pulmonary embolism. It's a distinct regional pattern of RV dysfunction where there's akinesia of the mid free wall but normal motion at the apex. Okay, and uh, this is quite a decent one, uh, about 94% specificity for pulmonary embolism. So, when you do an echo, not only do you look for uh, dilatation of the left atrium or evidence of uh, raised uh, PA pressures, but you also look for movement of the free wall of the right ventricle. If there is abnormality of movement of the free wall of the right ventricle, it is a sensitive sign to tell you that there is something going on in the pulmonary artery, i.e. a pulmonary embolus, so acute pulmonary embolus, okay? McConnell's sign. Thoracic right. should also know this because you deal with pulmonary embolism. What is this test being done and why do you do that? Let me know when uh, and then I'll move on. What is this test being done? And why do we do this test? I want the eponym, which means I want the name of the test. Okay, it's called as the Lovenberg sign, okay? And a Lovenberg sign is for eliciting deep vein thrombosis. When the two calves are wrapped with cuffs, and if there is asymmetry to intolerance of the pressure, which means one leg can tolerate the pressure and the other leg gets acute pain, then it is a sign that you're dealing with deep vein thrombosis. This is one of the earlier signs of deep vein thrombosis, okay? So early deep vein thrombosis will actually give you a positive Lovenberg sign, okay? Say yes, somebody. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, what is this? This is very classical. You must know the answer to this. Abnormally short PR intervals, abnormally long QRS complex, and most importantly, presence of a delta wave. Yes, sir. Delta wave is very classical and you must know what it is. Okay, this is the Wolf Park White syndrome, okay, WPW. Anytime you get conduction problems, if you don't know any answers, then better to call it WPW, okay? <laughs> but delta wave is the, is the main one that comes in WPW. And it happens because of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Okay, this is paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia caused by conduction through abnormal accessory bypass tract, which is the bundle of Kent between the atria and the ventricle. And it's characterized by a triad of wide QRS, relatively short PR, and a slurring of the initial part of the QRS, which is called as a delta wave. Okay, this is 100% an MCQ question. It will come. Wherever you, whatever exam you do, wherever there's a cardiac element to the exam, this is a favorite, favorite question of the examiners. So I will, so I'll show you this once again. Uh, so it is seen in familial WPW associated with mutation in gamma 2 regulatory subunit of AMP activated protein kinase. So it's called as PRKAG2. So just, just vaguely remember PRKAG2 and that's associated with WPW. I'll show you this. This is what it is. So this picture should stay in your mind for all times. This is 100% MCQ question, okay? No matter what, whether you're going US assembly, whether you're going PLAB, whether you're going uh, anything with cardiac element, uh, uh, ECF, uh, uh, the, whatever, the European boards or whatever, this question always gets asked. So it's a very important slide, okay? Don't forget that. Oh, shit, I have too far ahead. Sorry about that. Okay, this is 
already is self-explanatory. But tell me what is thin sign again? It's a repetition question. For one mark, tell me two conditions in which you do thin sign. It's a sign to, for irritated nerves, okay? It's performed by lightly tapping or percussing over the nerve to elicit a sensation of tingling or pins and needles in the distribution of the nerve, okay? So the commonest uh, place where you do is in carpal tunnel, where the median nerve is compressed at the trap now. And you, you want to do this because you want to differentiate carpal tunnel from thoracic outlet syndrome. So when you get thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, you have to rule out any localized cause of a ner nerve, uh, nerve uh, compression. And so always, always thinnel sign becomes part of the SS thing for thoracic outlet syndrome, okay? So it's sometimes referred to as distal tingling on percussion or DTP. What is this disease? What is this disease and what are the symptoms? Tell me the symptoms or the areas in which the symptoms arise. Yes, sir. Tell me the disease and tell me the areas in which the symptoms arise. Okay. So this is Lerich's syndrome. Okay. This is a syndrome of iotoiliac occlusive disease. The distal ischemic symptoms are present. Uh, one is pulseless femoral artery. Okay, that's the most important symptom because of uh, occlusion of the iota and the iliac veins at the iota iliac uh, junction. Uh, so first is claudication of buttock. So it's all in the pelvic area. So the symptoms are claudification of the buttock, impotence, and atrophy of the buttocks. Most important, this is atrophy of the buttocks. You see an atrophy happening. And that gives you the idea that you're dealing with Lerich's syndrome. Okay. All right. What is happening here? Let me ask you a question. How many of you actually understand ECGs? Give me a feedback to say yes or no. Yes, yes. Yes, you do. Yes, sir. Partially. So you don't want a class on ECG there. No, no, we yes. want revision. Test, test on ECG. We want that for the grades. You want the class. You want the class on ECG. It's very yes, important. Yes, yes. 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 Tell you yes. it's very important. Very important. Okay, I will. I'll prepare a class on ECG for you guys. Thank you. What is this happening? Thank you. Diagnosis. Okay, sir. Okay, this is Venkipak's block. Okay, Venkipak's phenomenon. Uh, it's second degree AV block, Mobitz type 1. Okay. Second degree AV block, Mobitz type 1. Now, what is the maneuver done and where have you seen it being done? Name of the maneuver and where have you seen it being done? I am pretty certain you've seen it being done every day in your clinical practice. Every day. So, why are you doing what you're doing? You're seeing somebody. To something around the airway. Why? And give me a name. Yes, what is this maneuver called as? Yes, sir. Okay. This is Selix maneuver. Okay. And this is done during intubation, during cricoid pressure during intubation to prevent aspiration. When you apply pressure on the cricoid, particularly when you're doing a crash intubation. What you're doing is your pressure is transmitted beyond the trachea into the esophagus. And by doing this, you're actually compressing the esophagus. Okay, so the esophagus is being compressed. And what you want to prevent is aspiration during intubation. So whenever you see an anesthetist intubating, you will always realize that there is a second person who's actually compressing on the cricoid cartilage. So it's the cricoid cartilage pressure called as Selix maneuver. Okay. All right. Okay, so far? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. What's this? Shit, I forgot to take the sign name out. <laughs> okay, tell me what is this sign? <laughs> Westerman sign. What is this? Have you heard of this?
give me one or two points about Westerman side. Okay. It's a sign that represents a focus of oligemia, which is vasoconstriction, distal to the pulmonary embolus. Okay, so you look for a sharp cutoff of the pulmonary artery, and it's seen in about 2% of patients. It's a combination of dilatation of the proximal artery, of the artery proximal to the embolus, and collapse of the distal vascular. Okay, and it's appearance of a sharp cutoff. So have a look again and see. There's a sharp cutoff here. See this artery coming here and there's a sharp cutoff. Artery coming here and there's nothing. There is no artery seen here in this area. Okay? So there's a sharp cutoff. And that's called as a Westermark sign. In pulmonary embolism, you will need to know this. This is actually there. When we show you an x-ray of a patient with pulmonary embolism, we are looking for all these signs. Okay? This is a Westermark sign. Okay, there are three signs which I want you to identify. I want three separate signs that you see on this test. There are three marks on the chest x-ray. One is a black arrow, one is a white arrow, and one is just a white arrowhead. Give me the name of three signs. All of them are related to pulmonary embolism. I'll help you. The black arrow is Westermark sign. But what are the other two? Give me a name. You have to give me a eponym. Somebody in M. This is a classical exam, exam oriented question. I will show you this test x ray and ask you to identify the signs. That's why it's not good to do this test on a phone, mobile phone, because you cannot see an enlarged figure. I am sitting on a computer with a large screen and I can see all the signs, but you can't see the signs because you are on a small mobile phone. Yes or no? No, sir. No. <laughs> Shall I go ahead? Yes. Okay, the three signs are Hampton's hum. Westermark sign and Pala's sign, okay? And I'll show you each one of them, just wait. So here you can see this, this white thing here. What is that? And a black thing here. So that is the Pala sign, okay? So what does that represent? Let's go through both of them. So let me tell you, Hampton's hump is seen in pulmonary infarction following a pulmonary uh, embolism. So there is an Atelectasis, the area of atelectasis, the square atelectasis that you, the triangular atelectasis that you see is called as Pala's hum, uh, is called as Hampton's hum. The, it's a plural based shallow wedge shaped consolidation in the lung periphery with the base against the pleural surface and the apex towards the hum, uh, towards the island. So triangular area in the periphery is called as Hampton's hum. Okay, and it's named after Aubrey Otis Hampson. And the Pala sign is that enlargement of the right descending pulmonary artery. Okay, so three signs. I'll go back to that again. Uh, Pala's hump is enlargement of the right pulmonary artery. Wester Green's is an abrupt cutoff of the pulmonary artery and no blood supply distal to the pulmonary artery. And Hampton's hump is this triangular wedge. Can you see the triangular wedge in the periphery? The area of infarction that you get, that is called as Hampton's hump. Okay? So the area of infarction is triangular with the base towards the pleura and the apex towards the hilum. So Hampton's hump, Westermark sign, and Pala's notch. Okay? The notch that you see is the Pala's sign. Can you see here? It's a dilatation yes. of the pulmonary artery proximal to the clot. 
that's the green is distal to the clot you cannot see anything and hampton's hump is in the periphery where there is infarction of the of the lung okay this is actually very important these three signs mm. uh, in the exam we keep and mm -hmm. all exams we keep pulmonary embolism okay and we keep a simple chest x ray and it is a clear cut answer which you can get 100% marks so always remember a chest x ray of a pulmonary embolism has three signs that's the green sign which is distal to the clot pala sign which is proximal to the clot and the hampton's hump is in the periphery because of the blockage there is a infarction of that triangular infarction that is called as hampton's hump okay made sense or no guys understood or no yes sir yes yes sir it's very important i'm telling you all of you people again particularly the dnb guys going for exams uh, a chest x ray with pulmonary embolism is one of the commonest x rays kept in the exam okay and then you go on if you cannot even identify the basic things first then we cannot discuss about pulmonary angiogram and we cannot discuss about you know what is the treatment of pulmonary embolism and all that okay you have to first know how to diagnose a chest x ray with signs of pulmonary embolism very important okay and you got to look for the mcconnell sign which is again a sign on echocardiography that's also part of pulmonary embolism where the free wall of the r rv does not move there is uh, a kinesis a kinesis of the free wall of the rv okay what is this the arrows what are those thoracic people are excused but cardiac people need to know what it is and is it a pathology or is it a normal thing is it a heart by the way Yes or no? Okay, this is called as McCallum's plaques. Okay, these are McCallum's plaques are irregular thickenings, usually seen in the left atrium, from subendocardial lesions, and usually it is exacerbated by a regurgitant check. So whenever you have mitral regurgitation. Uh, then you get this sort of uh, irregular thickening in the left atrium. So this is usually seen in the atrium. Okay, all of these. These are. This is because of the direct. The jet causes a pressure effect on the subendothelium area of the left atrium, and so this is called as McCallum's plaque. Okay, very often when you are doing a mitral valve repair, you will come across these uh, lesions in the left atrium. And you have to identify them. They are called as McCallum's plaques. What are these lines? These are some lines which are lamellar shaped. Okay, I have given you a clue. It is lamellar, which means there's one line in the middle and then multiple lines surrounding it, like a tree bark. It's like a bark of a tree. But what is it clinically called as? I'll help you. This is a clot, actually. So, what are these lines called as? Whenever you're learning something, there are four four zones of learning. Okay, one is I know, I know, I know, I don't know. I don't know. I know, and I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes these slides are all designed for the fourth quadrant, which is I don't know. I don't know. And then when you see a picture like this, suddenly you have moved from the fourth quadrant into the third quadrant, which is a better quadrant. If you don't know what you don't know, there is no progress. But if you know what you don't know, <laughs> then there is hope for you you understand that's why these slides they may look as very difficult but they are designed to address the fourth quadrant of your learning okay shall i continue yes yes sir 
Okay, these are Zahn's lines. Okay, so these are la Zahn lines, and I'll tell you about Zahn's lines. Zahn's line is thrombi formed within a cardiac chamber or the aorta. It may have apparent laminations. Okay, laminations is the key thing. The walls there are multiple layers, and these are formed because of proteins that get trapped proteins and platelets that get trapped with the fibrin. Okay, so there's alternating layer of platelets admixed with some fibrin. So fibrin, platelet, fibrin, platelet, that is what forms a Zans lines, okay? And it is separated by darker layers containing more red cells. So there is a peripheral to darker layer, okay? I'll just bring it back up. So there is light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. This is a clot. This is what clots look like, okay? And the, the dark area is because of RBCs and the light area is because of platelets and fibrins. And this appearance of a clot is called a Zans lines, okay? Zans lines. Are you happy? Yes or yes. no? Okay, how many got this answer right? <laughs> no, sir, I got wrong, sir. No. no. <laughs> Who got Danish got it right? Very good. Okay. No, no. No. Okay. So don't worry if you don't know the answer. I'm trying to address the area of learning where you don't know what you don't know. Okay. What is happening here? What is happening here and what is this sign? Sign which gives you an idea of what is there in the underlying area. Explain to me the sign and give me a name of the sign. Forget the needle, the needle is not there. It's clinical sign seen in the area where the needle is going. What is that sign called as and what is it due to? Imagine the needle is not there, but that is an area where the sign comes up, which gives you an idea of what is happening underlying. Yes, sir. Okay. This is called as on Bruges sign. Okay. On Bruges sign. What happens in an on Bruges sign is there is epigastric bulge due to a massive pericardial effusion. It's a way of diagnosing pericardial effusion when you don't have access to an echocardiogram. Okay, if you feel in the epigastrium, you see a bulge because the pericardium bulges into the epigastric area. And when you're trying to aspirate a pericardial effusion, the on Bruges sign helps you to direct your needle into that area. Okay, all right. So it's a sign of massive pericardial effusion, on Bruges sign. What is the anomaly? And give me one or two points about the anomaly. Cardiac boys will know this, hopefully. The thoracic boys don't need to know this. But it is a very classical picture, what I'm showing you. Not the one on the left, but the one on the right. The one on yes. the left is normal. The one on the right is what we want to know. What is the anomaly? So the left is normal. And what is happening on the right? What is this anomaly called? Either you know it or you don't know it. It's quite classic. Yes, yes sir. Okay, this is Epstein's anomaly, okay? So what happens in an Epstein's anomaly is malformation characterized by a downward displacement of the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle due to anomalous attachment of the tricuspid reflex. It is commonly associated with maternal exposure to lye. Lye is a, a chemical agent, okay? So this is what is Epstein's anomaly. They see the tricuspid valve, this is where it's supposed to be. In Epstein's anomaly, it's way down here, okay, way down. So your right ventricle is small, your right atrium is very large, and usually it is associated with an ASD, okay? So usually you will also get ASD. That is Epstein's anomaly, okay? Okay, all right, what is this? Tell me the name of the operation and tell me where you do it. Yes sir. yes, sir. Okay, so this is Nissen's fundoplication for 
one extra mark what is a two third wrap called as yes sir yes sir okay all right so this is nissen's fund application for treating gastroesophageal reflux disease uh, surrounding lower end of the esophagus with cuff of a gastric fundal muscle to increase lower esophageal sphincter competence okay so it's an incompetence of the gastroesophageal sphincter what is the two third wrap called as somebody tell me aloud okay. I, i don't have it as a slide now pet two pet two pet very two pet two pet good okay what is this anomaly there are some signs you can see there is winging of the scapula there is hornus syndrome with drooping of the eyelids the shoulder is rotated the upper arm has redness there is muscular dystrophy of the arm and diminished length and most importantly there is deformity of the wrist this is called as a waiter tip and usually it is because of damage to c5 and c6 nerve roots what is the name of this anomaly you have all read it in medical quest science but you have to know it because thoracic outlet syndrome is part of thoracic surgery and you have yes, to be able to differentiate it from this and the next one there are two anomalies which i'll ask you about what is the name of this palsy damage to c5 c6 rotation of the shoulders redness of the upper arm muscular dystrophy of the arm and reduced length of the arm deformity of the wrist called as waiter tip deformity it's turned backwards associated with the honor syndrome and associated with the winging of the scapula this is herb's palsy okay usually herb's palsy affects the upper lobe nodes the lower one is called as clump case okay now what is this these are the three to the right of the picture these are the three ways how you get this one either an hyper extended arm with a sudden stretch to the scapula or when you are delivering a baby you hold the arm instead of the head and you pull the arm to deliver the baby out these are the two ways you get the injury and the classical is this claw sign your your uh, your hand goes into a claw look at this baby with a claw sign okay what is this palsy i just told yes, you 2 seconds ago okay it's clump case palsy all right clump case palsy is lower brachial plexus palsy okay lower brachial plexus palsy okay uh, this is the cell this is the cell i want you to name the cell commonly seen in small cell carcinoma what is this cell i told you it is seen in small cell carcinoma it's in fact one of the diagnostic features of small cell carcinoma Yes, sir. Yeah, it is the Kulchitsky yes. cells. Okay, Kulchitsky cells. You have to be able to identify this. This is a diagnostic feature. It's a neuroendocrine argentafin cell present along the bronchial epithelium, particularly in the fetus and neonates. And small cell carcinoma has granules which are similar to Kulchitsky cells. And Kulchitsky cells are also seen in carcinoid tumors. Okay. So this is a classical finding of Kulchitsky. You must know that carcinoid tumors originate from the Kulchitsky cells. Okay. What is the stain? This one. What is the stain? Give me a name of the stain, and what tissue do you use this to see? Yes, sir. this is right stain okay and it's classically used for blood and bone marrow films all right simple 
nothing difficult. But right stain is what's used for a peripheral smear and for uh, blood and bone marrow focus. Okay, what is this effect? Describe Haldane's effect. I hope you guys are writing this down. Yes, yes sir. No book we are writing. Sir. Describe Haldane's effect. Have you heard this name? Yes, sir. Oxygen yes. dissociation curve. Hey, okay. Haldane's effect is deoxygenated hemoglobin having a greater affinity for CO2 than oxygenated hemoglobin. Okay, so it's very simple. It's deoxygenated hemoglobin having a greater affinity for CO2 than oxygenated hemoglobin. Okay, and this is what causes the shift of the oxygen dissociation curve to the left. Okay, so very important. This is called an Haldane's effect, where oxygen displaces CO2 from the hemoglobin. This is called an Haldane's effect. Yeah, okay. What is this disease? I have blanked out the name here. The description is here. It's absence of membranous part of interventricular septum, usually accompanied by other defects. This thing that you see, what is this disease? It causes ventricular septal defects. It's another name. It's another name for ventricular septal defects. What is the name, official name? for VSDs. Cardiac boys must know this. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. This is Rogers disease, okay? Rogers disease is the name given for small congenital VSDs less than 0.5 millimeters, okay? And 0.5 centimeters. So Rogers disease is the name that you have to call BSD. What is happening here? <clears throat> there are some markers on that thing, particularly V4, V5, V6. What is the sign? I, 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 sometimes I have a feeling that you may not be reading ECG very well. So if you know ECG well, you will be able to answer this. Otherwise, there is no hope that you will answer. Even the thoracic boy should know some ECG, okay? Basics of ECGs is needed for thoracic surgery also. What is this on the ECG? Yes or no? No, sir. Okay. It's Cabrera's sign, okay? It's Cabrera's sign. So Cabrera's sign is a left bundle branch block. What he was seeing here, is a left bundle branch block, okay? And it is uh, notching at 0.05 seconds in the ascending limb of the S wave in V3 and V4. This is, this is the one that you look for, the notching of the ascending limb of V3 and V4, okay? So look at V4 here, and you see a notch being formed. Can you see this notch, this arrow? Okay, continuously you see this arrow, this notch being formed. That is Cabrera's sign, suggestive of an MI, uh, suggestive of left bundle branch block in an MI. Okay, in particular, this is 25% sensitivity. All right, what is D spine sign? Thoracic, come on, thoracic boys. What is D spine sign? Uh, it's okay if you don't know Cabrera's sign, but you have to know what is DS spine sign. So you have to tell me what do you do in a DS spine sign, and number two, what is the diagnosis that you get if DS spine sign is positive? Yes or no? No, sir. Okay. No means you don't know, or should I wait? <laughs> don't know, sir. Okay. So this is auscultation over C7. You have to auscultate over C7 
and the breath sounds become larger over D7 than over the over C7 than over the chest, and usually in the presence of a posterior mediastinal mass. So whenever there is a posterior mediastinal mass and you're auscultating the chest, you have to auscultate at the apex of the chest around the C7 area. C7 is cervical 7 at the back. Okay, so in the triangle of the neck, when you auscultate over the posterior triangle of the neck, you will get increased breath sounds. And this is because the presence of the mass in the posterior mediastinum actually conducts the sound to C7. So in lymphoma and in tuberculosis, the spine sign will come positive. Also in a schwannoma, also in a neurofibroma, the D spine sign will come positive at C7. Okay. All right. What is this area? This blanked out area. And it is an area where you percuss for what is called as a castle sign. So what is this area called as? And what are the boundaries of this area? I hope these are not difficult questions. These are standard clinical questions. What is this area called as? Showing you the sixth rib, it's showing you anterior axillary line, and it is showing you costal margin. What is this area called as? Lined by the anterior axillary sixth rib and the costal margin. And you auscultate and percuss in that area for certain things. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. This is called a strobe space. Okay. Strobe space. Trob's space. And strobe space is surface marking is left sixth rib, left mid axillary line, and the left costal mark. Okay. Or anterior axillary line. It's okay. And if it is dull, it usually represents splenomegaly, and that is called as castle sign. Okay, and splenomegaly can be present in aortic regurgitation when you have got uh, uh, back pressure changes. Okay, so if trom space is dull, usually it's an area of splenomegaly, and that is what's called as castle sign. Okay, all right. So these are all the areas that when I when you do a clinical examination of the chest. When you talk to me clinically, you have to say, I have auscultated or percussed supraclavicular area, infraclavicular area, mammary area, and trom space. That is the clinical significance of this. So when you're doing a long case or a short case, and then you're presenting to me clinical findings of the case, I want to hear this uh, these words. I want to hear on auscultation of the supraclavicular primary area and probs space. You have to use the word probs space and the examiner will know that you understand what you're doing. Okay. This is basic clinical examination. Again, another question on basic clinical examination. Okay. Uh, what is this? Can you see these two things here and going here? Unfortunately, I forgot to Forgot to cover one of the names. What is this area called as? This area here. Okay, I'll give you the name because I forgot to cover it. It's the chronic isthmus. What is the significance of the chronic isthmus? Clinical examination. Okay, simple clinical examination. What area is the chronic isthmus and what is the significance of the chronic isthmus? Write down one, one line. What is the clinical significance of the chronic isthmus? This is classical chronic isthmus. This, can you see this? This is called as chronic isthmus. But what is the clinical significance of the chronic isthmus? Yes, no, continue. No, no, sir. Okay. It's a band of resonance over each shoulder connecting zones of the lungs. The re resonance is over the anterior and posterior aspect of both sides of the lung of the chest apex. 
It is bounded anteriorly by clavicle, posteriorly by the trapezius muscle, laterally by the acromial process of the scapula, and medially by the neck structures. It is five to seven centimeters in width and is resonant, normally resonant, but in the presence of a tumor or any abnormality, particularly in pancos tumor, you will get dullness in the chronic isthmus, and that is what is the answer I was looking for. In the presence of supraclavicular lymphadenopathy, in the presence of a pancos tumor, the classical clinical examination you have to say is the area of the chronic isthmus was dull. This is what is the clinical importance of this area. I'll show you that area again. So this is this is the apical area there. This band. This band is important across the two shoulders. It's on both sides and normally it is resonant. When you percuss it, it is resonant. But it becomes dull when there is presence of a pancos tumor or a thoracic outlet tumor or a uh, thoracic outlet neurofibroma, neuroma, lymphadenopathy. All of these will give you dullness in the chronic isthmus. And clinically in the exam, when you talk to me about a pancos tumor, I want to hear the word being said that I percussed the chronic isthmus and there was no evidence of dullness or there was evidence of dullness. Okay, so it is important to know what this area is, particularly if you're exam going. Okay, all right. So this was for the acutely exam going people for thoracic surgery, even for cardiac as well. Okay, what is this sign called as? It's prominent sternocleidomastoid and something empty in this area. Sternocleidomastoid is prominent and this area is empty. Anybody wants to answer this? Exam going, thoracic exam going people? Trail, trail sign. sign. Trail sign. Very good. This is the trail sign. Why do you get the trail sign? Uh, because of the tracheal deviation to the same side. Yeah, deviation of the trachea. Okay, so this is trail sign seen in deviation of the trachea. Okay, prominent sternocleidomastoid and absence in the jugular notch. You feel in the jugular notch and you won't feel the trachea because the trachea has moved away to the side of the pathology. Okay, please name the pathology. It's at the back here. I want you to name the pathology and I also want you to tell me what is this gap called as. Name the pathology and name the gap. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. This is Zenker's diverticulum, okay? And what's the gap? Killian's dehiscence. Uh, Killian's dehiscence. Very good. Killian's dehiscence. Okay, what forms the Killian's dehiscence? Mm -hmm. Between the inferior constrictor muscle and griffopharynx. Very good. So it's the inferior constrictor muscle, lower border, and upper border of the griffopharynx muscle. Good. Okay. Easy. Okay, so the Zenkers diverticulum is a pharyngeal diverticulum from premature contraction of the cricopharyngeus muscle on swallowing. It leads to progressive upper esophageal sphincter narrowing, leading to posteriorly directed hypopharynx, causes progressive food stasis and dysphagia. Okay, so two marks, one for identifying the diverticulum and one for identifying Killian's dehiscence. okay? And if you want an extra mark, you can take for telling me the boundaries of the clear face. So what is this? Have you heard this name? I'm yes, assuming sir. everybody's heard the name, but what is it?
Okay, so it's a it's platelet and vessel interaction. Von Willi Willi Brown's factor is a carrier for factor eight. Okay, so it serves as a carrier for factor eight, and it for bridges collagens and platelets and favors platelet aggregation. So deficiency of Von Willi Brown uh, Willi Brown factor gives rise to clotting deficiencies. Okay. So it, it uh, WV factor is very important for platelet and vessel wall interaction. It's a glycoprotein. Uh, there is in the body there's a glycoprotein one uh, B nine major receptor for WEF. And so one Willy Brown factor is one of the factors you have to keep in mind as a bleeding deficiency. Okay. All right. What is this? What is Carney's complex? Anybody knows what is a Carney's complex? Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. There is a Carney's syndrome and there is a Carney's complex. So I'm not asking about Carney's syndrome. Okay. Cardiac myxomas with spotty pigmentation, okay, associated with endocrine tumors, particularly Cushion syndrome. Okay. So cardiac myxomas, that is Carney's uh, complex. PRKAR1 alpha G. Okay, this is Carney's complex. So all these are signs of Carney's complex. Okay, multiple spotted things on the face, particularly around the, uh, you get multiple myxomas, not just around the, in the uh, heart, but you can also get it around the eyelids. You can get it in the mammary glands. You can get it in the testes. It's also associated with schonoma. Okay, 5% of schonomas will have Carney's complex. So when you see a patient with a posterior mediastinal tumor, you have to keep Carney's complex in mind and you have to examine the patient systemically. If a patient with a schonoma has got hyperpigmentation on the skin, multiple spotted hyperpigmentation of the skin, in the investigations, you have to say, I will do an echocardiography to rule out cardiac myxomas, okay? So it's quite important. It's actually a endocrine, neuroendocrine system. The whole thing gets involved. Okay, so you need to know that. All right. What is this? You, if you don't know this, it's okay. But this is a hair. Okay, this is a head with lots of curly hair. There's a lot of uh, keratodermatitis of the hand, of the leg. But more importantly, there is some ECG changes which are taking place. That's why I bought this here. This is a uh, ECG uh, question rather than a uh, clinical question. It's more of ECG question. Okay. You, you're seeing some ECG changes here in F. That is the most classical things of this syndrome, of this disease. It's called as Naxos disease, okay? So you get this huge curly hair, lot of this thing, and you get a lot of... Uh, it's usually seen in the Greek island of Naxos, but most importantly, it's an erythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy okay for the cardiac boys this was there and palmoplantar keratod keratoderma and woolly hair it's called as woolly hair okay you need to don't need to know this so much it's just uh, one of the pictures which i'm talking about okay what is this procedure happening name the procedure simple name the procedure Yes or no? So need some time. Yeah, take your time. I don't have a, I have all day. <laughs> Look at the second picture, okay, and that will give you the truth what's happening. You must know this. This is actually yes, sir. cardiac boys must know this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No. Cardiac one, you cannot tell me I don't know this. You have to know this. This is the Fontan's procedure, okay? So in a Fontan's procedure, it's for treating tricuspid atresia, pulmonary atresia, hyperplastic left heart syndrome, described in 1968. The IVC is connected to the pulmonary artery, okay? And long-term complications include arrhythmias, protein-bearing enteropathy because of edema of the liver and small bowel, okay? Because of the back pressure changes. There's a lot of back pressure changes when you connect IVC to the PA. Okay. What is this? Oh, 
One yes, mark. Sir. Name what you're seeing there. The thoracic boy should also be able to name this. Yes, sir. Okay, this is the St. Jude's valve, okay? All right. The St. Jude's valve is a prosthetic valve. It's a bileaflet valve with two semicircular discs that pivot between open and closed positions with supporting struts, first used in 1977. Okay. What is this and why do you do it? Two questions. One is what is it? And second question is what clinical condition would you do this? All the dust has to be dusted off the memory. That is why yes, the pictures sir. have been bought. In. Yes, sir. Happy? Yes. Okay, this is the Trendelenburg's position, okay? Why do you do it? Air embolism. What else? Blood loss. Yeah, anything, anything, anywhere, anytime, whenever there is hypotension, you want to overcome the hypotension, you do an Okay. Where the angle of the head is inclined to 45 degrees. Okay. All right. What is this? Improves the venous return. What is this? One line answer. Clinically, you're seeing this. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Okay, this is the Raynaud's phenomenon. Okay. And Raynaud's phenomenon is exaggerated vascular response to cold temperature or emotional stress. Okay. Manifested by symmetrical, sharply demarcated color change of the skin of the digits due to abnormal vasoconstriction of digital arteries and cutaneous arterioles. Okay. This is very classical. Raynaud's phenomenon. Okay. Two things have been marked out. They're blanked out. I want you to name both of them. And if anybody gets this wrong, I'll kick them. I want you to name this blue mark and I want you to name this blue mark. Can you see the blue marks? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Give me a name for this and a name for this. Yes. Okay, that's the angle of Louis, okay? So angle of Louis is the sternal angle between the sternum and the manubrium, and the other one was the jugular notch, okay? So angle of Louis and jugular notch, two marks if you got both of them correct. What is this effect? It is similar to the McConnell sign. If you remember, I used the word McConnell sign somewhere earlier. So tell me what is the name of this effect and where, what condition do you see it in? It is similar to the McConnell sign. What is happening here? Look at the picture, particularly the B part is what I want you to look at, B. I spoke earlier about the McConnell sign. So what is this effect called? This is the, McConnell is a sign, the effect is called as something. Okay, this is called as Bernheim's effect, okay? Bernheim's effect is reverse in pulmonary embolism, which means that the right ventricular failure causes septum to bulge into and compromise the left ventricular failure. Okay, so same thing as a as a McConnell sign, but the bulging into the left ventricle is called as the Bernheim's effect. Okay, all right. Name. What is the red mark? There is a classical name given for that. What is it?
Yes, sir. Okay. This is the pancos tumor. Okay. Thoracic outlet tumor, also called as pancos tumor, also called as superior sulcus tumor. It's an apical lung cancer in the superior pulmonary sulcus, which invades neural structures around the trachea, including the cervical sympathetic plexus, leading to severe pain in the distribution of the alarm nerve. Orner syndrome can happen on the same side as of the lesion. Okay, all right. What is this sign? Or syndrome, sign or syndrome, anything. One of the two names, one name. You kick yourself if you don't get this right. Yes, sir. This is the order syndrome, okay? Drooping of the eyelid. Can you see that as compared to the right, the left eyelid is drooping. Common things where you see Horner syndrome. Somebody tell me. Vishen can tell me. Where do you see Horner syndrome? Yeah, superior circus uh, tumors, posterior okay. apical mediastinal or thoracic outlet tumors pressing on the T1 ganglion. And where else? And uh, as a complication of post... Uh, yeah, post surgery. Post surgery uh, post complication. Surgery. Yeah. What is this valve? Some of them I've kept them yes. simple so that you feel good about yes. yourself. Yes. Yeah. The <laughs> confidence boosting. <laughs> <laughs> this is the confidence booster slide. Yes. Okay. This is the Star Edwards valve. Okay. It's a ball and cage valve. It's the oldest prosthetic valve in continuous use. First used in 1965. Okay. All right, what is this sign? And you can see the clinical condition on the left side in the lateral chest x -ray. What is this sign? The thoracics cannot complain that today there was no thoracic. There was enough thoracics to die. There is more coming. What is this sign called as? Yes, no, maybe. Continue, not wait, what? Not waiting, sir. Okay. Okay, this is called the Hoover sign, okay? And you tell me what is happening in a Hoover sign. Hoover sign is a modification in the movement of the costal margin during respiration. It's caused by flattening of the diaphragm. And usually it suggests an empyema or other, other intrathoracic conditions which have caused a change in the contour of the diaphragm. So whenever you get flattening of a diaphragm, the respiratory movements at the costal margin becomes inward, okay, it changes. And that is what's called as a Hoover sign. It's a clinical sign that you use when you examine a patient to tell you what's happening in the pleural space. What is this syndrome? All of the things are there on the side. It's okay if you don't know, but it is also associated with some cardiac pathology. Yes, sir. Okay, this is the Williams syndrome, okay? And Williams syndrome is supravalvular aortic stenosis, mental retardation, and elfin cases. What you're seeing no, here no, is no, elfin no. faces. Okay, elfin faces. That is classical. This is a very classical picture of a patient with supravalvular aortic stenosis, mental retardation, and elfin faces. It's associated with hypercalcemia due to abnormal sensitivity to vitamin D. Uh, idiot, idiopathic hypercalcemia of pregnancy. This is usually a complication of pregnancy. Okay, uh, You get a loquacious personality. You get ab abnormal sensitive hearing deletion in elastic genes and uh, some other problems, okay? So it is basically supravalvular aortic stenosis, elfin uh, faces. The most thing is the face is very different and there is mental retardation, okay? What is the sign being done? Two signs, two names for this sign. So one mark for naming each of the signs. So you get two marks if you tell me both the names. 
and one extra mark if you tell me the pathology. And everybody needs to know this sign. Yes. You have to describe this sign to me. Everybody yes. needs to know this, okay? It's a very, very important sign. But two names are there for this sign. The Bancroft sign or Moses sign, okay? I showed you the Homans and this is Moses. And in Moses sign, it is classically done in deep vein thrombosis. It is the compression of the calf forward against the tibia, which causes the pain. If you do a side-by-side -side movement of the calf, there will be no pain. But when you push it against the tibia in front, it is the compression of that uh, venous thrombosis against the tibia, which causes the pain. So in the exam, we ask you to elicit a Moses sign. If you do it side-by-side -side movement, then that is not Moses sign. It is actually lifting the scarf and compressing it against the tibia. That is called as Moses sign or Bancroft sign. Okay, so it is forward and compression, not side by side. When you do side by side, you get no pain, but when you push it against the back of the tibia, you get pain. That is classical description of a Moses sign or Bancroft sign in deep venous thrombosis. So two signs: Oman sign and Moses sign. You must know for a DVT. Clinically, whenever you get a post-op post patient on the ward who is complaining of uh, shortness of breath or uh, swelling of the leg or pain in the leg, think DVT, okay? Post-op patient, always DVT. Okay, again, this is a repetition of a previous slide. What is the name of the sign? This is extra mark for you. And what disease do you do it in? I showed you yesterday this slide. I don't know why it got repeated, but it must be some reason. What is the, there are two phases to the sign. One is you're elevating the leg, and second, you're asking it to hang it down from the side of the table. What is the name of the sign? <clears throat> yes or no? Yes. This is the Berger sign, okay? And Burgess sign is for peripheral vascular disease. The red foot becomes pale with elevation and then becomes cyanotic with hanging on from the side. Okay. All right. What is this? I think look at A rather than B. Look at A. That gives you the clue on to what's happening. And this was covered by uh, Simran in his lecture. Simran, when he gave his lecture, he spoke about this syndrome. That's why I put it in. Yes. Yes. Okay. This is the Munia's Kuhn syndrome. Okay. So what happens is there is a dilatation of the trachea. So recurrent pneumonia, copious spirulent sputum production, hoarseness, and la load and cough. This is tracheomegaly. Tracheobronchomegaly. Okay, let me just go back and show you. Look at the trachea. I want you to see the trachea. Can you see the trachea? That's not normal, isn't it? It's a grossly enlarged trachea. So it is tracheomegaly and classical seen in Munia's Kuhn syndrome. Okay. Present in the 30s or 40s, more common in male. The tracheal lumen increases with Valsalva. Okay. And this is an autosomal recessive uh, disease. Patient presents with recurrent pulmonary infections. That is the main problem with this patient. Recurrent pulmonary infections. Okay, what is this? Have you ever heard of the word Austrian triad? Yes or no? Am I no, in sir. the area no, of, no, no. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, sir. Okay, this is seen in pneumococcal pneumonia, meningitis, and it's endocarditis, okay? Endocarditis, aortic valve endocarditis associated with aortic regurgitation in a case of pneumococcal pneumonia. This is the Austrian triad, okay? So aortic valve endocarditis associated with aortic regurgitation 
in the background of pneumococcal, the virus is or the bacteria is important. So it's pneumococcal pneumonia meningitis. This is the trial. These three things are the trial described by Robert Austria. Okay. All right. And this is what you see. Okay. This is an is the same thing. It's an Austrian trial. Okay. So look at the chest X-ray. You see pneumococcal pneumonia, a lot of patchy infiltration in the right chest. Can you see that? And then here is, look at the aortic valve. There is all vegetation on the aortic valve. And they are doing a root replacement here because of the infective endocarditis. So classical pneumococcal pneumonia associated with aortic regurgitation is called as Austrian trial. Okay? Cardiac boys, you must know this. It is not difficult. It is part of your curriculum. Okay, now I'll give you this next time. You have to tell me what is the anomaly. There's paper thin myocardium. The myocardium is really, really thin, usually, but not always limited to the right ventricle and presents as a heart failure in infancy and early childhood. What is this anomaly called as? Paper thin myocardium. The right ventricle is paper thin, very, very, very thin. Normally it is thin, but this in this anomaly, it is paper thin. This is the classical thing for this anomaly. It's called an Ulz anomaly, okay? Ulz anomaly. Look at this right ventricle. Can you see the RV? It's very, very thin and very distended. And the LV is very small as compared to the RV. And that is called as Ulz anomaly. Okay. Name this disease. You should be able to name this. Name the disease. Yes or no? Yes or no? I've shown no, this sir. in my lectures. This is Osler Weber induced disease, okay? It's uh, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. Okay? Uh, it can be a large source of chronic blood loss. There can be systemic emboli, high output cardiac failure, but for thoracic particularly, you got to know it's associated with uh, pulmonary AVMs. Okay, pulmonary AVMs with uh, telangiectasia sort of uh, picture on the face or other part of the body is osler weber rendu syndrome. Okay, this is very classical, this picture, very classical. And it comes in, in, in uh, MCQs. Uh, Osler Weber Rendu is frequently mentioned in MCQs with the history of uh, pulmonary AV malformations. It is associated with pulmonary AV malformations. Okay? So you need to know this one. Oh, shit. I went ahead. Sorry. Operation. What operation is being done? Okay, I'll just go ahead. This is Mustard's procedure, okay? Uh, Mustard's procedure is for treatment of transposition of great vessels, rarely used, but it's an atrial inversion procedure which connects RA to LV, which pumps out to pulmonary arteries. So LA to RV becomes systemic pump to the iota, okay? And various intraoperative pericardial and prosthetic intraatrial baffles are used. You must read about this. This is there in congenital cardiac. They must have proceed. Okay, tell name the syndrome. Forget that. Name this syndrome. It's also called as aortic arch syndrome. There is a pulseless disease, pan arteritis of the great vessels, and most importantly, classically, it is most common in Asian women. Name this disease. It's called as aortic arch syndrome. Where you don't get, you get pan arteritis of all the great vessels. Yes, sir. Okay, Sakayasu's disease. Okay. All right. Okay. Name. What am I talking about? Okay. Name the heading for this. Statistical tests. Statistical tests can fail in two ways. 
but the first way is a correct hypothesis can be rejected what is a correct hypothesis can be rejected what is that called as in yes, statistics sir. yes sir hmm. everybody else here got it or no a correct hypothesis can be rejected that is the question it's a type one error okay all right <laughs> name the sign and what clinical conditions are you seeing here name the sign and what clinical condition is being represented two points for this yes or no the arrow you can see the arrow come on guys this is very basic yes yes sir. in the floating water lily sign okay floating water lily sign all right seen in hydrated cyst of liver or lung both okay all right now the next one is you may not know it but it's okay signs in carotid arthritis with pain along the Carotid to the jaw, ear, and temporal. Okay, you may not know it. It's okay. It's called as face sign. Okay, okay. It's pain in the jaw in carotid arthritis. It's an extension of Takayasu's disease. What is this name? What you're seeing? Give me a name for this, and you have to tell me what is the level of whatever you're seeing. Trauma. You may see it in trauma, and in one other classical condition, you see it. What is this called as? Yes or no? This one is more important. The second one. See this? Can you see this? See something? There is a. discontinuation and the continuity of this transverse process what is this called as also there is a discontinuity here can you see that classically seen in trauma and also sushant singh rajput had this yes sir okay it's called as the hangman's fracture okay all right it's part of pars intra articularis of c2 it's an hyperextension injury seen in trauma this this uh, x ray comes in trauma okay when you are dealing with trauma you have to see this and identify this okay what is pots disease percival pot and by the way percival pots was from st bartholomew's hospital where i work pots disease what is pots disease one mark for pots disease yes sir okay it's tuberculous involvement of the spine okay occurs in 2% of tb cases so it's tb spine is called as pots disease okay identify what we are talking about okay hoarseness of compression of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve yes, a greatly dilated left atrium in mitral stenosis it can happen because of that so hoarseness of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve secondary to either a dilated left atrium or enlarged tracheobronchial nodes or dilated pulmonary artery what is this syndrome called as or if you got cancer of the lung and you got tumor invading the left side station 5 and 6 you get yes sir of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve what is the syndrome called as thoracic boys must also know this i want the name of the syndrome it's otner syndrome okay otner this will come in the exam a long case with hoarseness of voice with ca lung i will ask you what is this syndrome it is otner syndrome 
okay and in cardiac it will come because of mitral stenosis you will get dilated left atrium and the patient will complain of hoarseness of voice and the examiner can ask you what is this syndrome called as you have to know it's otner syndrome okay all right what is this it's very classic you must know this Isano. Yes. Sir. The yes, sir. Peripheral signs of a central yes. pathology. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. It's osseous nodes. Okay. Osseous nodes are tender to touch, painful, purplish, split the subcutaneous nodules in the pulp of fingers and toes, thinar and hypothenar eminence. Okay. And they are usually seen in acute bacterial endocarditis. They are because of minute infective emboli which go to the periphery. And form these nodules, and actually, if you aspirate them, you might get some organisms in them. So, usually seen in subacute bacterial endocarditis. Okay, subacute bacterial endocarditis. Another thing that you get in subacute bacterial endocarditis is this lesion. The first one is because of an immune response, immune complex being formed. The second one is because of an emboli. To the hand, so the emboli to the hand is called as what, and the immune complex is called as what. Immune complex is called as osseous nodes. What are the emboli, the micro emboli called as? So can you see that it's in the palm of the hand? Yes, sir. Okay, this is called a Janeway's lesion. Okay. All right. One mark if you told me Janeway's lesion. What is happening? <clears throat> Give me a name. And why do you do this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, this is the Heimlich's maneuver. Yes. Sir. Okay, the Heimlich's maneuver is abdominal thrust maneuver for clearing foreign objects from the airway. Described in 1974 by Henry Heimlich. Yeah. Okay. Good. Now this one, I want you to tell me what is the pathology. Okay. So hypersensitive pneumonitis from exposure to antigens of microorganisms, which colonize equipment used in farming, usually seen because of moldy gray, moldy hay, grain or silage. There is also aspergillus umbrosus, fungus or thermophilic actinomycetes. Oh, I give you the name. What is it called as? Farmer's lung, and this is the picture. Okay. This is a classical picture of farmer's lung. In this, the occupational history is very important. Anybody who comes with recurrent chest infections, difficulty, progressive shortness of breath, and infective symptoms, you must ask for the occupation of the patient. And if the occupation is farming, then you know the diagnosis could be farmer's lung. Secondly, to fungal infection and a fungal infection from the hair. Okay. All right. What is this blue thing marked out? There is a blue thing which is marked out. You had cardiac morphology lectures for three Sundays. What is the blue thing marked out? Come on, cardiac boys, you must know this. This is a sitter. Yes, sitter. sir. Easy, easy one. Hundred percent, you can get this right. Is the Marshall's vein okay? Marshall's vein in the oblique sinus, all right, in the left atrium. Uh, I don't know why I, I forgot to do this. So Allen's sign is also seen in pulmonary embolism. This is a combination of fever, tachycardia, and tachypnea. That is specifically called as Allen's sign. Okay, sorry, I forgot to. So in, I've shown you many signs in pulmonary embolism. Please go back and read all the signs of pulmonary embolism. But clinically, when you get fever, tachypnea, and tachycardia, it's called as Allen's sign. Okay, this is gone. So tell me what is this test? Or what is this that I'm talking about? Okay. A method of combining results from a number of independent studies to give one overall estimate of effect. Yes. Okay, this is a meta-analysis, all right? That is what I was describing. 
What is this bundle? I spoke earlier about WPW. What is the blue marked out bundle? What is this blue thing? What is that marked out? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's the bundle of Kent. All right. Bundle of Kent is an AV bypass strut in WPW syndromes that directly connects atrial and ventricular myocardium. So it's a bypass channel, okay, for uh, the WPW. So there is a bypass to the blockage. And that is what gives you some of it. Okay, what is happening here? What is this? What am I showing? There is a central pathway in the pons, particularly in the pneumotactic center, in the apneustic center, and it is controlling excessive respiratory muscles, and it is also controlling the diaphragm. The external and the internal intercostal muscles are being controlled. What is this reflex called as? What is the reflex called as? Come on, guys, quickly. Yes, sir. You must know this. It's the Harrenbrough's reflex. Muscle of the airways. It's responsible for apnea. So it decreases breathing frequency as a result of lung inflation. I think somebody asked this. I think uh, Rohit Kumar asked this question earlier. In the lung transplant. Uh, yeah, in the lung transplant thing, I think. So herring bro reflex is, that's why I put it in there for you guys, because he asked this question. So it is a reflex apnea due to lung. What is happening here? Look at the right one, which is near normal. And a few hours later, after one procedure, the left side is showing. Something was done to the patient in the between the first one, which is a normal x-ray, and the second one. What is this? What has happened to the patient? There's something done to the patient, which acutely shut down the respiratory system. Every day in your clinical practice, you will see this, some form of it. The hemoglobin of the patient was seven gram per cent. Yep. Yeah, this is trolley, okay? Syndrome. Trolley yes. syndrome. Trolley syndrome is transfusion related acute lung injury. So transfusion reaction occurs within six hours after transfusion of blood products, characterized by pulmonary edema, and usually because of the antibodies in donor's plasma, causing pulmonary sequestration of the recipient's leukocytes. So this is an acute reaction to blood transfusion. Trolley, okay? Okay. Next one is the same one. I showed you this before. One mark if you give me both the names. There are two names to it. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay, this is Farkas notes or Troisier's notes, okay? So it's associated usually with uh, stomach cancer, but can also be associated with GI or pelvic malignancies, left supraclavicular lymph node enlargement in the presence of uh, stomach cancer is called as uh, Farkas nodes. 1848 was Farkau and 1886 was Troisier. So in France, they call it Troisier's node. In, in the rest of the world, it's called as Farkau's node. Okay? And usually it's a very subtle sign of many malignancies. Okay. What is this? Let me tell you, the tissue is lung. This is gross histology of a lobectomy specimen. The tissue is lung. What is this thing you're seeing in the, in the white? What is it called as? There's a name to it. <clears throat> I discussed this earlier in the, in the month when I was teaching you online. What is the name for? What are you seeing? Yes or no? Okay, this is Gohm's lesion, okay, or a Gohm's complex. Sorry, Gohm's complex is primary area of tuberculous infection, okay? 
All right, what is this? Spot diagnosis. Happens in families. It's a familial, it's a genetic condition. It's also associated with infertility. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is Cartagena syndrome, okay? So this one is for Nikkei. So Cartagena syndrome is a triad of sinusitis, bronchiectasis, and situs inverses. What you have to notice there is there is situs inverses. Can you see that the heart is facing the other side? How many people notice that? The heart is facing the other side. There is severe bronchiectasis in the patient. Okay, that's classical. So situs inverses is very important in Cartagena syndrome. And it's associated with ciliary dysfunction. And because of the ciliary dysfunction, you get recurrent respiratory tract infection. But also it is associated with, uh, with uh, infertility because the cilia of the sperms is also not uh, very good. So very often these guys, are, you need to do also in uh, fertility assessment for the family patient, for the families of this patient. Okay, described by Manis Cartagena. Uh, a Swiss physician. Okay, this is an arterial switch operation. I don't know why I give the whole thing away. So this is a Jatin's arterial switch operation. Uh, is for treating transposition of great vessels. This is the one that you do nowadays. Pulmonary and artery and aorta are transacted above the valves and switched. Okay, and coronary arteries are moved from old aortic route to the new aorta. See this one. Okay, so this is an arterial switch. I forgot to take away the top name, so I can't ask you this question. But it's an arterial switch. What is happening? So what is Dresler's beat? Somebody tell me what is Dresler's beat? You'll get marks if you tell me what is Dresler's beat. There's something happening here. Fusion beat, this is what gives you the answer. Fusion beat, what is Dressler's beat? And in what conditions do you get it? Okay, it's a fusion beat seen in ventricular tachycardia. That's what you need to know. Dressler's beat is a fusion beat. That notch that you're seeing there, this is Dressler's beat. If I do an ECG chat lecture, I'll tell you about it. Okay, what is this equation? Vd upon Vt. What is the equation used for calculating dead space? This equation is used to calculate physiological dead space. Do you know what is the name of this equation? You have to know this. This is exam going people have to know this. This is asked on the table and in MCQs. On the Viva table, I usually keep this equation and I then take the discussion forward. But if you don't know the name, you cannot have any discussions. Yes or no? Yes or no? Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay. This is the Bohr's equation, man. Bohr's equation is used to calculate physiological dead space. It's very important. Is VD upon VT is used to determine physiological dead space. This is 100% MCQ. 100%. Okay. It comes in almost all papers that I've gone through. Somewhere there has been the Bohr's equation being mentioned. So please, please read about this. Okay. What is this? A method of calculating a correlation coefficient if the values are sampled from a normal population. Statistics. What am I talking about? I remember coefficient, you can see coefficient, but as opposed to the other one, this is a normal population. The other one is in an abnormal population. So what is, Correlation coefficient in a normal population. <clears throat> We've done this in my statistics lecture. This is the Pearson's correlation. Okay, it's important to know this Pearson's correlation. What is the other correlation? 
spearsman very good spearsman correlation very good okay what is this this blue marked out has a name inner circular outer longitudinal what is this in between there are some little dots that are being highlighted which are neuron cell bodies with glial supporting cells what are these things called as neuron cell body that's the clue it's a neuron cell body between the outer longitudinal and the inner circular layer see how they will twist the question and ask you yes sir yeah this is if i put you give you this slide if i give you this picture in a viva table and if you're not able to answer you'll kick yourself because it is something that you know yep in the orbacus plexus okay it's a different way of asking the same question that's why i bought it in okay so orbacus plexus is myelic plexus between the longitudinal and the circular layers of muscles provides motor innervation to the two muscle layers and secretor motor to the mucosa okay so what is this what is meissner plexus yes sir one mark if you tell me what is meissner plexus okay, it's a submucous plexus okay and in the inner veins the glandular epithelium muscularis mucosa intestinal endocrine cells and the submucosal blood vessels okay what is this what is cushing strand yes sir it's raised icp but what are the three things in the triad hypertension bradycardia irregular respiration that is the cushing strand i showed you this earlier as well so it is a triad used in the icu to know that there is raised icp it's classical combination systolic blood pressure hypertensive but pulse rate goes down and the respiration goes down this is classical so very important okay cushing strand okay uh, you may or may not know this the what you are seeing here is multiple pulmonary artery aneurysms okay this is for the thoracic voice multiple pulmonary artery aneurysms and everything on the side cough hemoptysis dyspnea venous thrombosis chest pain fever chills pulmonary hypertension intracranial hypertension is a clinical presentation but for you in the exam if i put up a slide a ct scan with multiple more than one pulmonary artery uh thrombosis what does it mean uh, aneurysms what does it mean multiple pulmonary artery aneurysms classical this is classical yes sir okay you stovin syndrome okay you stovins osler webu renders you must remember this osler webu render is pulmonary avm multiple pulmonary artery aneurysm is you stovin syndrome okay multiple pulmonary artery with peripheral venous thrombosis okay what is this sign called as in deep venous thrombosis when you put a sigma manometer above the knee and inflate it to 40 mm of mercury you cause pain at the site of the thrombosis what is this sign called as frcs cardiothoracic surgery may have this and in even in clinical practice so you know moses sign homan sign and this is another sign moses sign homan sign you don't do because you are worried that you might cause an embolus so you do this you put a bp cuff on the about the knee and you inflate it to 40 mm and you'll get acute pain on the side what is the sign called as ramirez sign okay please read all the signs of dvt it's quite important so i told you about thyroid hyperthyroidism and thyroid goiter i signs you must read that and you must also read signs of dvt and you must read signs of peripheral vascular disease okay these are three extra signs which you need to know over and beyond your normal pathology what is this you may not know it it's a home zat it's a single ventricle with normal it's okay i don't mind that what is this happening here there is a blue mark which i have covered here can you see the blue mark which i have covered what is happening here 
one mark if you tell me the name of what is happening and the second mark is if you tell me exactly the description of what is happening a is normal and b something there's a lesion which has happened at one area and there is a change distal to the lesion it's the change distal to the lesion that is the name that i'm looking for so there is something, some injury to this structure here, as a result of which everything has got disrupted in the distal area. What is the name of this change? You know the it's Valerian degeneration. Okay, so you must know what is Valerian degeneration. Valerian degeneration is a degeneration of the distal portion of the nerves following axonal injuries with breakdown of axons and formation of myelin ovoids from catabolized axon fragments. Okay, what is this? Which test is this? Thoracic people must know this. Repetitive nerve stimulation. What disease do you do this then? <laughs> Repetitive nerve stimulation. Where do you do it? Yes, sir. Okay, this is called as a Jolly's test. Okay, Jolly's test is repetitive nerve stimulation in myasthenia gravis. This is important. I will show you this slide. I'll show you this picture and tell you what is the clinical condition you're trying to find out. It's myasthenia gravis. Okay, uh, it's a sequence of repetitive nerve stimulation studies specifically designed to look for neuromuscular junctions. A positive test is more than 10% decremental response with three hertz of repetitive stimulation. It is about 80% sensitive in diagnosing myasthenia. Described by Friedrich Jolly. Okay, what is this formula? I see you. Something is happening and then there is a compensation happening. How do you calculate the compensation? What is this formula? This will actually come in the exam. I haven't done acid base balance with you. But this formula comes in the exam, in the MCQs. It's called as the Winters formula, okay? And the Winters formula is, it gives you expected PCO2, that is the respiratory complication compensation in uncomplicated metabolic acidosis. So you need to know this. This is respiratory compensation in metabolic acidosis. So that Winters formula is used to calculate the expected CO2. So bicarb into 1.54 plus 8.36. That is the formula. And this is the Winters formula. And if the expected thing is not the way it is supposed to be, then something is wrong. The, the, the compensation is not adequate. And this will be discussed in the lecture on acid base balance. Okay, sorry, I told you. What is Maythernus syndrome? It's okay, ilofemoral deep vein thrombosis from impaired venous return because of compression of the artery. So the vein, uh, vein compresses the artery and that gives rise to a iotoiliac syndrome. Forget about this. What is this? Yes. Yeah, it's factor 10, factor 10 in the clotting. It's called a Stewart's factor, okay? Now name this abnormality. Multiple pulmonary stenosis, it's okay. If you don't know this, it's okay. It's Cuton syndrome, forget that, okay. Name this one, this is important. It's a combination of gastric leomyosarcoma, pulmonary chondroma, and adrenal paraganglioma. We spoke about a disease, and now this is the syndrome. This is a combination. In, in, you will see a lesion in the lung, and uh, you yes, will sir. be asked about this. A single isolated lesion in the lung which is a pulmonary chondroma. Yes, the combination is leomyosarcoma, pulmonary chondroma, and adrenal paraganglionoma. This is called as Carney's syndrome, okay? There is no cardiac abnormalities. In a Carney's disease, there is cardiac abnormalities. 
But in a Carney syndrome, there is no cardiac abnormalities. What have I marked out? I blanked out something here. It's in a type of respiration that you see this. Sorry, not respiration. It's in a it's a sign. Yes, sir. What have I blanked out? It's called as the Kusmal sign. Okay, Kusmal sign. Uh, it's jugular venous distension during inspiration. Okay, and classically seen in constricted pericarditis. So Kusmal sign comes in constricted pericarditis because normal increase in venous return with increased intra-abdominal pressure from diaphragmatic contraction leading to increase in the right atrial pressure from a non-compliant. So when you've got constrictive pericarditis, there is increase in the compression on the right ventricle. Hence, there is a jugular notch increases, okay? And it's usually seen in uh, constrictive pericarditis, but it's generally negative in cardiac temporal. See this, this, this notch that you're seeing in the jugular venous is distension of the jugular venous thing with inspiration. So when you take in a deep breath, you're increasing the intra-abdominal pressure, you're increasing the chest wall thing. So the constricted pericarditis compresses more on the right ventricle, and so you get this increase in the jugular venous pressure. This is very classical in constricted pericarditis. This will come, you'll get a case with the long case with the uh, constricted pericarditis, and we expect you to see for Kusmal sign. Okay? So that's how you look for it. Oh shit. I what is this? Kusmal's uh, respiration with hyperapnea. Forget this. I'm sorry about this. Okay. Let's look at this one. What am I describing? Again, this uh, we have done this. So it's one millibond disease. Forget that. Sorry. What is this sign? So we have seen a lot of other signs. We saw Moses sign. We saw Oman sign. Uh, what is this sign? When they cough, they get a pain in the leg. It's called as a Luvel sign, okay? So this is what I want you, I want you to know all of these signs. This is the slide, this slide is important. For DVT, I want you to know all these signs, okay? So Homan sign, Lovenberg sign, Ramirez sign, Liska sign, Luvel sign, okay? And these lower two are okay, they don't matter. But the first four or five you must know in a DVT. What is Simon's focus? Okay, it's present in tuberculosis, okay? It's an apical, sub-apical nodule. It's usually because of hematogenous spread of infection in the lower half of the lung. So it's a sub-apical nodule in the lower half, it's in, as, as opposed to Gohn's focus. Gohn's focus is a primary focus in the lung because of tuberculosis in the lung. Simon's focus is tuberculosis elsewhere, which spreads via bloodstream and comes to the lung. That is called a Simon's focus. What is this reflex happening here? Bradycardia hypotension. This is the basal gyrus reflex, okay? Uh, this again is part of physiology, normal physiology. It's activation of the receptors in the atria, great veins, and left ventricle, causing parasympathetic tone, increased parasympathetic and decreased sympathetic activity. This is the answer to it. Increased parasympathetic, decreased sympathetic, okay? All right, what is this respiration? Okay, what is this respiration? Give me a name. Okay, Chinese source breathing. Okay, now from here onwards, everything is just a flash and give me the name, flash and give me the name. Okay, are we okay? Do we still have time or you guys are tired? We have time. I've got about 15 20 slides, but these are easy ones which you've seen before in my lecture. So I, I want you to go through it again. It's a repetition. Okay, what is this quickly? This, this, yes, sir. Yes, sir. this yes, sir. wasting. Okay, this is Gilead Sumner's hands. Muscle wasting, 
secondary to thoracic outlet syndrome. What is this sign? Thoracic outlet syndrome. What yes, is this sir. sign? Yes, sir. Yes. Is the Paget Schroeder's axillary subclavian vein effort thrombosis? Usually comes when the patient uh, does sudden exercises, and then there is swelling of the arm, and there is axillary vein thrombosis. Okay. So one mark if you get the Paget Schroeder's name name right. What is this sign? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this is the Morley supraclavicular pressure test. Yeah. What is this sign? Yes, sir. Accents test, okay? I'm not going to explain each one of these. I've already done a lecture on this. So let's just go through this. This is Tinnel sign. We've said that. What is this sign? Yes. Yes, sir. Write it down, okay? Write the answer down. This is Allen's test for carpal tunnel. What is this sign? Yes, sir. Phalanx test, okay. All right, from here onwards, it's all instruments. Again, purely repetition, but it's worth it because I want you to tell me the names of all the instruments, okay? What is this? Write down. Yes, sir. One yes, mark if you get the name correct. You have to use the name of the person. I want to know the name of the person who is this. Is. Okay, it's Doyen's rib aspirator. What is this? We have 10 more, five minutes. We'll quickly finish this. Give me a name. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay, Adson's periosteal elevator. What is this? Yes, sir. Okay. It's moon shaped periosteal elevator, half moon, full moon, quarter moon. Who's what is this instrument? Yep, yes, sir. It's Bailey's rip approximator. What is this? Yes, sir. Finocetto rip spreader. What is this? Yes, sir. Burford's rip spread. What is this? Yes, sir. Whose whose instrument is this? Yes. Davidson's capillary retractor. Okay, it's Gert Steele's rib shear. Gluck's rib shear. This is all to give you more marks, okay? I bought this in so that you feel good about yourself. This is the Sormash Fry's rib shear. What is this? Yes. Allison's lung retractor. What is this? Yes. Sir. Duval's lung forceps. What is this? Yes, sir. Rampley's forceps. What is this? Yes, sir. Debakey's vascular clamp. Yes, sir. Sutinsky's aortic clamp. Yes, 
Yes, sir. Okay, Dibek is aortic clamp. Yes, sir. Sam's bronchus clamp. Sarod's bronchus clamp. Okay. It doesn't have a name, it's a circular sermon saw. What about this one? We're coming to the end of the session, don't worry. Give me a name. Cardiac surgeons, give me a name. Yes or no? Yes. I'm sure you must have seen this retractor. It's Morse external retractor, okay? Same thing as this is also Morse external retractor. What is this one? You have to give me a name. Okay, it's Delacroix Chevalier, so I'm a retractor. Give me a name. It's already there. <laughs> this is the Robichick's technique. Are you okay so far? Yes, sir. Yeah? Yes, sir. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Marks, marks have gone up or no? Okay, last six slides, okay? Last six slides. <laughs> Name the incision. Trans maneuverable. Okay. Name the incision. Transclavicular tartanals. Name the incision. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Chop also. Name the incision. Yes, sir. Grunenwald. Okay, I've done a whole lecture on this, so you should be able to answer all of this. Name the incision. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, hemi clamshell. It's okay, this is transclavicular. What is this? Yes, sir. Yeah? Trap door incision. Fantastic. The time is 7 o'clock. We've finished exactly at 7 o'clock. Thank you very much, everybody. So I'm going to first stop the recording. Where is the recording? Uh, let me just come back here. And uh, where is it? Pause. Stop share. Okay. And let me just...